Howdy everybody, it's been a while since I've recorded a lecture. I'm a little bit excited right now because um, I love kicking off a new course. It's, I put a lot of effort into designing new course content. If you want to see it, most of it is already up on GitHub as far as the numerical demonstrations. The lectures will start to be recorded from today on. I'll start building a YouTube channel out with all of them. But let me get right into it. So um, to begin, this is a course on subsurface machine learning. Now, when I say subsurface, I do acknowledge my background in geosciences, geophysics, working with the, the ground, what's in the ground. But at the same time, just as I work with geostatistics and recognize that everything I do could be used for trees and for fish and for any type of fundamentally spatial problem, I would say the same thing about this course right now. And in addition, I would make the statement that many of the methods that we'll demonstrate or that we'll work with will be standard machine learning types of methodologies. Maybe there's just more of an effort to make it a course that can be communicated to or accessible to geoscientists, engineers who may be concerned with working with spatial problems. So in a way, the course will still remain quite general. So what are we going to do during this lecture? Well, this is the first one. And so we'll do a quick introduction. I promise after this, for the remainder of the course, I will never have slides again where I just brag. Then I'll go ahead and try to motivate people to be interested in this course, state the goals of the course, provide a bit of a class description, the objectives. Of course, people are always concerned, and rightfully so. They're concerned with the grade distributions, how I'm going to assign grades and so forth, and what I expect, and the plan, and we'll go in through that in that sequence. So who am I? Well, I am Michael Perch. If you are ever uncomfortable pronouncing my name, just go ahead and just try to say perch like the fish or like a bird is perching. And you'll say it as well as I say it. And in fact, you'll probably find if you have a background from the Ukraine that or from Poland, you'll probably find out that I don't actually say it properly. But that's 100 years in Canada. Our family lost the ability to pronounce our own name, I guess. I'm new at UT. I, I guess I'm going to reach a point here soon. I can't say I'm new anymore, but only for about a couple of years now. So a lot of things are new. I'm going to make mistakes. Go ahead and help me out. We're working on, we're doing this together. So I've done this. I've spent about 17 years in industry consulting, teaching, and working in reservoir modeling, characterization, statistical modeling, and so forth. And so I have some experience in data analytics and so forth. So I hope I can share that with you. I left the industry to teach. I enjoy teaching. It was one of my favorite parts of my job when I was in industry. And so my concern is always about making engineers and geoscientists who have the skill set so they can be competitive and succeed in their careers. And yes, I, there's an era of altruism in all of this. I'm a fan of democratic principles. If you've got ideas of how to run the course better or what we can do. I'm all about being um, driven towards adding value to the students. Let me know how we can best accomplish the goals of the course. And I'm always happy to consider updating and seeing what we can do. I'm an engineer. Fundamentally, I was trained as an engineer through my BSc. Master started in a geotechnical engineering um, program and then ended up in a PhD in quantitative. It really quantitative modeling within the subsurface and geostatistics and so forth. And I spent about 13 years in the Earth Science R&D group. I am an engineer, but if you're concerned, don't worry, I do speak geo. I've been told I, I, I am quite fluent in geo. And I would say that I'm an expert. I taught eight short courses in industry just last term alone, spring 2019, while teaching full time at the college and doing everything I should. And so I'm very much engaged with our industry. I am constantly called on to teach and to consult and so forth. So I know something about what's going on. I think as professors should, we know, should know what's going on in the real world, not just in academia. And I know that and I teach that. And I have to admit, I'm growing expertise. Like many people in our industry, in our field, we're picking up and learning new things about machine learning all the time. And so I have to admit, while I have a long history in data analytics, geostatistics, 
I can only claim perhaps, you know, years of experience in machine learning and I am learning a lot all the time. And so we're learning together a little bit. I'm also very active in outreach, social media, professional organizations. And so you'll find me, I'm inescapable, I'm kidding. You'll find me in a lot of different um, places. Why do I say that? Well, maybe I can give you some advice on how to get engaged in the professional committees as I think, or organizations as I think every professional should be. And I also, if you wanna follow and learn more, you can go ahead and even after this course is finished, you can follow me on Twitter, GitHub, YouTube lectures that I record for every single lecture I give in the university setting. And so this lives on. As I like to tell my students, the course content remains evergreen. It lives on long after the completion of this course. And so you have the opportunity to continue your learning journey, or perhaps you are a working professional. In that case, hey, very cool. Awesome. I'm glad you're doing this. Um, please carry on, and I love it. I'm so glad to see working professionals use this content. Office hours, well, um, I will have office hours, individual office hours. People can come to my office. There's the location right there on Mondays, but if there's too many people, um, I will move. We'll grab either a room on this floor or we'll move down to the student center on the third floor of our building. So if you come to my office here, and I'm not here at Mint, I got flooded or inundated and out of respect for the other professors around me I decide to move so just check those other locations to find me. Wednesdays I'll probably do them in the student study area. Um, I hope I don't disturb people too much if it gets a little too rowdy we can also grab a room on the third floor so check that too. Hong Gong Zhou is our TA for this course we're very fortunate to have him he's one of my most senior PhD students with a great level of experience in data analytics, geostatistics and machine learning. And so he's just fresh back from a internship um, working for a national laboratory, which was super cool. And um, we're s I'm just so happy to Hong Kong for accepting this role as TA. He's, he does an excellent job. Many students in the reviews will actually talk about how Hong Kong was one of their best TAs. So thank you very much, Hong Kong. We'll have our first assignment given on Monday, September 9th. I think that gives us enough time to cover enough content. And so from that point on, we'll have these regular office hours. Okay, so what are you gonna learn in this class? What do we expect to cover? And so in general, subsurface machine learning theory, methods, practice, for inference and prediction workflow construction. Now we'll get into the details in inference and prediction. We'll talk about how inference is trying to learn about the setting, the population. And we'll talk about how prediction is about trying to make some type of forecast or move away from our training data. We'll talk about what's currently done, established practice. I put this not in bold, but we'll, we'll cover a little bit of what should be done, best practice and gaps in current workflows, and what could be done, kind of novel methodologies that might be available to us. I don't think it's a good idea to get too much into kind of cutting edge research in a regular course like this, but we'll touch upon it. We'll make comments about it. We'll talk, it'll be mainly about what's in practice. So um, how to flu influence what gets done, how to critically evaluate machine learning when it's being conducted, because you're gonna run into it all the time. It's everywhere. And I want you to understand enough about it that you can critically evaluate models that are constructed. How to do it yourself, of course, build your own modeling workflows, that's a given. And then how to, importantly, how to communicate what is done, reporting the results. Because this is a fundamental issue we have within our industry is if people cannot understand what you've done, it's not going to add value. People will not action up, people will not act upon what you've done unless they can understand it, then they can support it. And so how do you communicate? Now you might think from that previous slide, well, that was pretty vague and can't you be kind of more concrete perch? And so let me try to be a little bit more concrete. So we'll get into the subsurface context and modeling opportunities. That'll be the first lecture or so. Fundamental Python for building workflows using open source machine learning tools. Pandas, NumPy, Scikit-learn, and so forth. And that'll be the entire course, but we will have some basic lectures, maybe one or two right up front, where we'll get into just basics of using Python. I have recorded videos, I can provide other resources, you should be able to get there. But I should say, 
If you're sitting here right now in this lecture and you don't have any intention whatsoever to learn Python, this might be one of those cases where you're on the airplane and they say that it's going to a certain city and you realize you're not going to that city. It might be a chance to kind of rethink um, participating because uh, I would expect a level of enthusiasm. You don't have to come prepared, but have enthusiasm to learn some basic fundamental Python to build workflows. That's That would be a bare minimum that I'd expect. And it's going to look great on your CV and I'll make some arguments for learning the code later on. Basic data preparation and feature engineering, that's essential. In fact, that whole data preparation thing, that's, you know, that's 90% of the workflow most of the time. So we need to understand that. And our data is difficult. So we'll talk about data. Machine learning for model building, um, for model building, and that we'll get into that. Um, we'll talk about inference and prediction type workflows. You'll see there's a lot of different methods and model checking, model communication, that's essential. I'll be expecting you to communicate um, as if you're talking to a manager on some of the assignments. We'll, we'll teach that, we'll work on that. And skepticism. Let's not just be gullible, let's be scientific about everything. We should be those cranky scientists who are skeptical of everything and understand the model limitations, and be able to scrutinize models. Now, um, you might say, well, Perch, now, come on, like, really, what are we covering? And so here's the concepts and methods that we will cover. And so this is a bit of a, a bit of a long list here, but I think it's a pretty good list. In fact, if you go to some fundamental books on machine learning, you'll find out that this list of methodologies is most of the ones they have in the book. So we're doing pretty good. Once we get through this, you should have a pretty strong background in machine learning. So first of all, got to cover the subsurface modeling context just one lecture or so, don't worry, not too much. Basic Python, NumPy for working with gridded data arrays, very convenient, very powerful methodologies. Pandas for working with tabular data, which we have all the time. And then Scikit-Learn for being able to build our machine learning. In fact, up until neural nets, we're gonna spend our whole time in Scikit-Learn. I like Scikit-Learn, great documentation, available right from Anaconda 3 installs, uh, super easy to work with. Very standard, so we'll we'll go ahead and we'll use Scikit-Learn. Basic probability and statistics. I believe fundamentally, it's my moral stand that we should not teach machine learning unless we first cover fundamental probability. I'm just saying it, and I must cover it, and I will spend one lecture on it. Apologies to students who took my undergrad course. You will have a little bit of repeat just for that one lecture, but it'll be a good um, review for you. Okay, um, we'll get into a um, little bit in statistics, multivariate analysis, feature transformations, and selection. Now, you'll see for a bunch of this stuff, distributions, hypothesis, testing, univariate statistics, I'm going to um, cite some of my previously recorded lectures and ask you to watch them. I don't want to turn this into a basic statistics course, but you kind of, we kind of really do need to cover some of that. So I will go ahead and ask you to watch a couple of videos. It's all recorded. Time series analysis, um, I threw that up front. It's gonna be distinctly different than um, what we do in many other uh, modeling methodologies. So I'll just put it right up front, but inference, inferential type methods, clustering, dimensionality reduction, and multi-dimensional scaling, which is super powerful and actually kind of, kind of cool, kind of groovy. We'll go into predictive type of methodologies, we'll start with the simplest method we could ever imagine, linear regression, which I will argue is uh, basically a form of machine learning. And so it's not a bad place to start. Ridge regression, lasso, um, we'll get into K nearest neighbors, which I really like. Naive Bay is super, super groovy, super cool, based on probability theory. I like that very fundamentally. Tree uh, based methods, the decision tree ensemble methods where we get into like more complicated stuff like tree bagging and random forest, which is pretty powerful stuff. Then we'll get into gradient boosting methodologies, support vector machines, and we'll finish up with a little bit of neural nets. Networks. So we'll do a little bit of model checking, model communication. So that's what we're going to cover in this course. At least that's the content I have right now. Um, we may add more. We'll see if, we, if there's interest in the class, we can look at adding different. Now, what's the idea of what, what do we want to do with class time? Yeah, you won't get a sense of this in the recorded lectures. The recorded lectures are going to cover kind of the lectures mostly. 
there'll be um, discussion, review, new content, and that's how we'll go forward. It'll, we'll try to kind of consolidate, move forward, consolidate, move forward. But I would really try to like to keep it to about half the time, hands-on experiential learning, demonstrations. And so I'm going to expect students to have demonstrations queued up, ready to go on their laptops. You're going to need your laptop in class. I'm going to have the demonstration workflow available to you on GitHub. I'm going to expect you to pre-run it, make sure you've got the data loaded, you're able to run through it. I don't want to get caught up every lecture with, you know, people having trouble. Now we're going to use the three low pay type principle though. If you spool up your laptop, you show up for class, it just doesn't work. Well, sorry, you're in the straw house and you just got to move to another house. So go find somebody whose laptop is working, sit down with them and let's just keep rolling. We'll keep moving. We want momentum. But um, let's have good discussion and, and chance to kind of try some things out together. I'll do a little bit of live coding at times. So I think that'll be kind of fun. We got a great classroom for that. What are the resources in order to support that? Because we got pretty lofty goals. We want to do a lot in this course. And so we're prepared. We've really prepared well for this. In-class lectures, we'll cover all the necessary theory, the methods, practice, strategy. I'll often come at things multiple ways. I'll come at it from the theory, then I'll show some simple examples. We'll build up. We'll try to make it very accessible to everybody. Class lectures are all going to be recorded and put on YouTube, as I always do as a professor here at the University of Texas. I think it's a good idea. I like having my lectures recorded. Students like it. People in industry watch them and they gain from them and I'm all about that. I think we're contributing to everybody moving forward in education. So um, all demos, data sets, workflows are going to be available on GitHub. If you don't know GitHub, go check out GitHub. Go to GitHub, look up on Google, GitHub Geostats Guy. You're going to get to my repository. I have 30 different repositories. There's a Python numerical demos that's full of lots of great workflows using Python, including all the workflows from this course. They're right here. So you can go to this link right here and get to my numerical demos. You'll see these are all of the, so far, and I'll probably add to it, the workflows that I designed to support this course with all the different types of machine learning methodologies. We'll have um, also the demonstration data sets are available right here. So if you try to run my, one of my workflows and it's missing a data set, go here. They're all there. So you have everything you need to proceed. GitHub, check it out. You know, even think about contributing. Um, put a pull request in for um, contributing to some open source somewhere. That's pretty cool stuff. Okay. Resources, other resources. The Introduction to Geostats course has many of the recorded lectures on basic statistics, data analytics, geostats, uncertainty modeling, so forth and so forth. There's lectures on hypothesis testing, bootstrap, and a lot of things like that. I also have a subsurface modeling course that's fully recorded now too. And so these resources are available to support the class. There should be minimal repeat. I try not to repeat too much, but as I said before, got to cover probability got to cover some other fundamentals and they were common to the other course so I may have shamelessly stolen from my other course okay so what would I expect from the an outcome from this course you've taken my course you're working with me we got a great term ahead of us at the end of it what would make me happy as a professor here at UT well you should have greater proficiency in machine learning maybe you have just a basic understanding you understand the role of machine learning, how and why it's entering basically all technical fields right now. Hey, welcome to the fourth paradigm of data-driven discovery. It's all around us. We're here now. As an engineer or engineer or geoscientist, you're going to encounter, even any type of scientist, you're going to encounter machine learning. And so you, if you have basic appreciation of machine learning, you understand what it is, what it can do, you know, I think that's great. That would be a, a wonderful outcome from this. Maybe we demystify machine learning for you. Level two, hmm, this is getting even better. Now we're talking about improved communication. Data scientists, machine learning, statistical modeling experts are joining your teams. I, I'm seeing it everywhere. I go to so many different companies. And whereas it used to be just scientists and engineers working together, now I'm finding there's a data scientist or two sitting there. I, I've gone to some teams and they have a Bayesian statistician on the team, or in one case, an astrophysicist. What's going on here? It's this recognition that there's commonalities, that there's opportunities to work across boundaries through 
data-driven approaches and we're putting experts on teams that may not be as strong on the domain knowledge side, but really, really understand the coding and the statistical machine learning types of methodologies. So they're growing in their acceptance, data-driven approaches, machine learning approaches, data analytics, being able to communicate better with these people is going to help you. Integration on a team is part of how we add value as a professional. I, I know that from my own professional career in industry, I did a lot to, I learned a lot of new things so I could communicate across boundaries. All right, level three, leveling up here, eh? So you maximize your impact. Now imagine if you have a project in which there is a domain specialty type of um, study. You're using your engineering, your geoscience, your science knowledge to study something. And then you have a data scientist working on the machine learning or other people doing machine learning. If you understand machine learning well enough, you can make sure that they've got the right data transformations, the right feature selected, that they're building good workflows to integrate your expertise, your knowledge into what they're building with their model. And you keep them from doing silly things. Or you get them to maximize value. You will contribute directly to the model and the modeling decisions. That's huge. You help them capture your engineering and geoscience knowledge. That's a win for everybody. You add more value. <laughs> awesome, eh? You build workflows in collaboration with gray box modeling approach. I like that. And the gray box modeling approach is right here. The white box is the idea of a model that's based on deterministic equations, physical knowledge of the underlying phenomena, detailed submodels that are based on physics. Okay. This is white box modeling. This is based on engineering and scientific knowledge. Black box modeling is more of the data-driven approach. It's data-driven, it's data-based, input-output representations. It's all, it's all based on working directly with the data. Gray box is when we do both. We've got all of our prior knowledge, our geoscience knowledge, and we've got all of our data-driven approaches and expertise of how to work with data, and we're doing both, sometimes in parallel. Sometimes we're building a white box, physics-based boxes based on the scientific engineering knowledge, and black box based on the statistic data-driven approaches, and they move in parallel together through the workflow, and they feed into each other. It's super powerful when you do that. I think it's a great idea. So, if we have enough knowledge about machine learning, we can contribute directly to that, because we can speak across the boundary to the people working in the data-driven domain. Ah, level four. This is where you go to the dark side, as they say in Star Wars. You go to the dark side of the force. You just go, that's it. I know I'm a geoscientist. I'm an engineer. I'm a scientist. But I really want to just be, I want to be building the machine learning methodologies on my own and contributing. I want to be mm, that unicorn who understands both the domain expertise, the coding, and the statistics, the machine learning types of approaches. Okay, so that's great. Let's do it. That'd be awesome. So you build your own machine learning models. You can solve very difficult problems. Actually, that did not have possible scientific or engineering solutions. We did not have first principles to be able to figure it out. And so we're learning new things in a data-driven paradigm. That's pretty awesome. Work with massive, high-dimensional data sets. You might find that you can't do it by just engineering then. It's just too complicated of a system. Or you could just be automating the mundane tasks. That's super awesome too, because guess what? You're now a scientist or engineer that does more science, more engineering, and less of the boring mundane stuff. And guess what? At the end of the year, super productive. You get the bonus. You get the promotion. You look great. And so you're adding value. Okay, I know there's always some anxiety about how do we grade this thing because everybody, we have to grade. Everybody has to get recognized for their effort in the course. And so this course is dual listed. We will have about half and half graduates and undergraduate students. Why did I do that? Well, first time to offer this course, course filled up immediately. There's so much pressure for this course. So much, so many students are interested in this course. And I had so many undergrads and graduate students really asking for this course. I accelerated it. I was not planning to teach this course this year. I pushed it forward and I want to service. I want to help everybody. And so that's why I did it. It's going to make a little bit more work. We're going to have to work together and make this work, but I think it'll be fine. We'll run the course the same for both. Now, if you look at the... Um, the grading scheme, you'll notice the one thing is that there's a final project for the graduate students. I'll talk more about the graduate student project. Um, this is the general breakdown right here. 
assignments. We'll have regular assignments, probably weekly assignments, most of the time, unless there's some really important football game. I know sometimes that comes up here at our school. Depends how our year goes. <laughs> um, quizzes. I don't do pop quizzes. I don't do surprise quizzes. I don't believe in attendance checks. You manage yourself. Um, I will give you at least one class warning. Now, you got to find out what's going on in class, so you better be ch checking in if you're not here. I'm not going to, there's no excuse. If you miss a quiz and you didn't notify me in advance or you're late with an assignment, you didn't notify me in advance, there's, I'm not going to be able to um, help you out. So go ahead, let me know if something's going on in advance. I'm all about supporting students. If you have a major family emergency, you can provide some level of documentation. I'm all about trying to accommodate and help out in those circumstances. Everybody has things happening. Um, midterms, we'll have two midterms. We're going to do it a little bit unusual though. We'll conduct the midterm, first one halfway through the term, the second one right at the end of the term. I want to keep everybody engaged right to the end of the term. Now you're going to wonder about that. What about the final? Final is an optional final. It's a no risk final. You write it if you want to. If you, you can make a choice. I will give you your in-class mark and you'll know relative to the grading whether or not what grade you're going to get. And then you decide if you want to try to improve it. If you do worse on the final, I throw the final mark out and you'll keep the in-class mark. All right, I put a class participation mark down here. I don't know. I just really want people to be part of the discussion. I want to encourage that and I want to incentivize that. That's what that's all about. And so please don't just sit in the back of the room and not participate. Please be actively engaged. Okay, so for the graduate students who are doing the final product project, what's the idea here? Produce a comprehensive, well-documented machine learning workflow in Jupyter Notebook. Think about it as the type of workflow that you could show a manager and they could understand it and be impressed. Think about it as the type of workflow you could show a student about to start this course mm -hmm, and they could benefit from it. Okay, so it's an opportunity to demonstrate your knowledge, which is what I really want when it comes to grading. And for a graduate student, I want a pretty strong level of knowledge. Demonstrate it. All the course learnings demonstrate high-level proficiency. Now, with your permission, I will seek to use these, uh, post them on, online on, Jup on GitHub, on my repository with full credit to the authors. Now, if they're really good and I like them a lot and I kind of want to add to it, I may come to you and say, hey, can I be a co-author, make some changes on it, and we'll kind of jointly do that. I don't think it hurts anybody. It's up to you. You can say no. No pressure ever. But I would also want to be able to use this in my future classes as demonstrations and examples. I think we need good content to support learning. And I want you to be part of it. Now, what's in it for you? It's going to be posted on GitHub with credit. Put it on your CV. You're now contributing to the knowledge within this space. And I think that's important. So contributions to GitHub are recognized in many companies. In fact, um, one of our professors in our department, Dr. Foster, said it quite well recently. He said, if you put on your CV that you know Python or you know C++ or something else, and there is nothing going on in GitHub, that's a red flag. People aren't going to believe you. We live in a day and age of repeatability. If you say you know Python, I want to see what you do in Python. And so I'm going to give you a chance to demonstrate you know something about machine learning by putting something online, open source, in machine learning. Okay, now I'm also thinking for assignments, I may put additional challenge questions for the graduate students to allow them a little bit more work, but an opportunity to demonstrate your additional knowledge. I think that's important. Textbooks. There's no textbook assigned for this course. My notes are quite comprehensive. I hope you're happy with them. My workflows are super well documented. I put a lot of work into them. I think you'll do fine with that. Now, if you want additional reading, I know this is a bit paradoxical, but I love this book. An Introduction to Statistical Learning, Statistical Learning is Machine Learning, with Applications in R. It's one of the most accessible. It's just a beautiful book. It's fantastic. I've learned a lot from it. I wish it upon you. Now, the other thing, too, because I know we're all starving students, is the book is available online for free from the publisher. No, 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 no. Not one of those websites. I mean, literally, it's legit. You can get it for free. And so check that out. You can, I should have put the link here, but if you can't find it, just let me know. Um, also, my own book, because, well, I told you I only brag for those first slides. I guess I'm bragging again. But I think when it comes to data analytics, which is fundamental to a lot of the workflow construction for machine learning, the textbook that we wrote with Clayton Deutsch from University of Alberta 
is quite accessible to geoscientists and engineers about data analytics for the subsurface. So I, I recommend it, some of the concepts there. And then we have, if you want something which is a more deep theoretical treatment of the topic, well, it turns out that James and All book is actually an abridged version of the more, much more deeper dive, the elements of statistical learning. And so go ahead and check out that book. It's uh, a bit of a steeper learning curve, but it can be quite fulfilling for you. Okay, now if we're going to talk about subsurface modeling and, well, machine learning in subsurface, we should mention what subsurface modeling is. Now, I'm going to have a lecture on subsurface modeling, but just today to motivate. There is, in general, there's a lot of topics we could cover. And those would include subsurface um, prerequisites, data preparation, univariate, multivariate statistical analysis, spatial statistical analysis, the estimation and trend modeling in space, stochastic simulation, methodologies by which we can produce reasonable models that match the statistical constraints and the data conditioning, uncertainty analysis, model checking, and ultimately, Everything we do in the data-driven statistical world is to support decision-making. Let me just say it for the first time, and I will say it over and over again. If what you do does not impact the ultimate decision, then you add no value. It's kind of true. It's kind of true. So we've got to impact the decision. And so what's very cool is subsurface machine learning can be applied to all of these steps. How do we work with the data? How do we do fundamental analysis of the data to understand the data? How do we break the data up in order to do that? How do we see patterns in the data? Oh, there's so many great things you can do with machine learning. How do we make estimates and build trend models? How do we make predictions given those models? There's so many things we can do with machine learning. So every single one of these fundamental steps in subsurface modeling can be impacted by machine learning. And that's an underlying theme of what we're doing here. Now you may need to, you will need to work, uh, you will need to work with Python. And so what are we going to need to be able to do in Python? And so if you're kind of trying to, you know, measure, measure and see where you're at, where you need to be, you should understand fundamental concepts of variables, data structures that are, that are useful for building workflows, like NumPy for grids or maps, arrays, and pandas for data tables, like you'd see with if you had individual sample data sampled sparsely across your setting, as we often do in the subsurface, you need pandas for that. Conditional statements, how do we build logic into our code? And that would also include loops and iterations. Statistical methods, the SciPy package is jammed full of all kinds of great fundamental statistical approaches. Visualizing your results, map, plot, Live. We'll be doing a lot with Matplotlib, in fact. And then data analytics, geostatistics. I'm going to invite you to download and to install my package for that. And machine learning will be mostly for 95% of the time, we'll be in scikit-learn. Right at the very end, we'll have to, we'll work with, not have to, we'll enjoy working with Keras and TensorFlow for our neural nets. More on software and coding. This is not a coding or software course, so don't be intimidated. I'm not, we're not doing any coding for the sake of coding. We're being very pragmatic about it. We're learning tools to be able to get the job done. Now, at some point you might say, well, maybe you could teach some CAN software. There are CAN software approaches, not open source, but CAN software for being able to solve many of the problems that we're talking about. I'm not a fan of teaching CAN software in a university course. I think I like to teach fundamentals, the theory, the practice, and then you would be able to go and pick up any CAN software program with that knowledge. And so if you have highly specialized software and I was to teach it, you could imagine it's really a use it or lose it situation. And by the time you graduate, it's probably you, you lost it. And it would not help you. You wouldn't be current when you leave UT. I'd rather teach you the fundamentals so you can pick up any software package and work with it. So yeah, so we'll, we'll use, it means we may be limited to simpler workflows since we're using kind of, you know, we don't have the canned environment to work in. We don't want to work with maybe like massive data sets that might, you know, just crash your computer, be hard to kind of build, um, more complicated. We might not have the full like immersive three-dimensional visualization and so forth. We might do a lot in 2D. We'll use simpler workflows with open source now. We'll sacrifice that right now, but I promise you it'll pay off in the end. Python, 
We'll use available packages with very basic, as I mentioned on the previous slide, just very basic coding concepts. Remember the variables, iteration, conditional statements. A lot of resources are available, included in my documented workflows to help you, and I'll conduct a couple of classes right at the very beginning on Python basics. So it's some of the basic workflow construction steps. Um, Python's powerful. Basic ability is going to look really good on your CV, so please don't, don't resist this opportunity to add this to your CV if you don't have any Python exposure up until now. Okay, the basics, you could start now if you heard that and you're, well, I need to do something now. You want to get ahead, that's fine. Um, I have recorded workflows and uh, assistance and demonstration workflows and so forth available on GitHub and on YouTube for NumPy for working with gridded data, uh, maps and models, and pandas for working in tabulated data, like in the case of well data, sample data. And so go ahead and check out my demonstrations. They're available to you. Um, if you want to jump into that now. Now, if you're sitting here and you're, I don't really want to code and perch, that's it. I'm just going to dig my heels on this. Let me offer you, a, this is one of my favorite slides, in fact, let me offer you reasons why all geoscientists scientists and engineers should learn to code. First of all, transparency. No compiler accepts hand-waving. You ever been in a room and everybody's standing around, somebody's speaking the loudest in the room, waving their hands a lot, and everybody starts getting to the kind of the, the nodding and everybody feels like they figured it out? No. Coding forces you to make bare your logic. All other scientists in the room, everybody can evaluate it, review it, see exactly what you meant. There's no hand waving. I love that. Reproducibility. Well, run it, get an answer hand it over to someone else, they run and get the same answer. This is one of the main principles of the scientific method. Um, I, I think that's a great idea. I've started to put, when I publish papers, my workflows, just started, put my workflows on GitHub so people can actually reproduce my work from my paper. I, I think that's good. Quantification, programs need numbers. Now, if you work in a world that tends to be more qualitative, being more quantitative could be helpful. And when you code, it encourages you to be more quantitative. You need to feed the program, discover new ways to discover the world. Open source, leverage a world of brilliance. Check out the packages, snippets of code. There's so much available to you. It's amazing. I had a problem with building a trend model. Next thing I knew, I was using AstroPy, which is an astrophysics package in Python. It was super cool. Sparse data convolution. It was really good at it. Yeah, it turns out space is space, right? Subsurface is space, space is space, kind of cool, right? Break down barriers. If you come up with a, a methodology, you start to figure something out, you want to build a tool out of it, you got to code it up. Well, if you don't know how to code, you throw it over the fence and the coders do it for you. No, that's not great. Sit at the table with the developers, the coders, share more of your expertise, get a better product. That's super powerful stuff. Uh, deployment. If you come up with something, a really good idea, and you code it up and you share it with others, you multiply your impact. Performance, metrics, or altruism, maybe you're the type of person who just likes helping other people out. That, hey, awesome, the world more, needs more people like you. I, I think I'm like that too, I hope. But performance metrics too. If you show at the end of the year that you impacted a huge group of people because you developed the tool and everybody started using it, guess what? That's that's going to be turkey for Christmas that year. That's going to be a pretty good bonus. And so that's good for you, and you'll promote well in the company. You add more value. That's good for everybody. Efficiency, minimize the boring parts of your job. Build a suite of scripts for automation of common tasks and spend more time doing science and engineering. You go home happier, I'm telling you. And guess what? Your hands, you save your hands because often those mundane tasks are the ones that are killing you with the, um, you know, killing you with the RSI and the repetitive stress injuries. They're, they're, they can damage you. And so when you can automate the things that may cause more harm to your hands with excessive mousing and keyboard work, it keeps you healthier too. Let me just throw that in there. Always time to do it again. How many times have you ever done something once? I don't know. Most of the time, two, four times, you know, 10 times. Guess what? It, it may take two, three, four times as long to script it up, but then you have it automated and you can do it again. And when you have to rerun it, it's not the big deal. You just rerun it. Guess what? That automation is very good documentation for workflow, which is actually better for you and everybody else in the future too. Be like us. It will change you. Users feel limited. 
The computer is a machine. They're stuck doing whatever the computer tells them they can do. Programmers truly harness the power of their applications and their hard work. They can do very novel, unique things. Okay, now I want to just give a couple of caveats. I'm actually pretty soft on this issue. Like any type of coding, scripting, workflow automation is good. You know, really, in fact, I look at what most people do in Python right now. It doesn't, I, I spend like, I don't know, decades working at Fortran C++. I've done full stack development before. What people are doing in Python is more like just scripting, putting workflows together. It's so much easier. That's cool. Don't have to go on a deep journey to become a C++ C-sharp expert. No, just basic scripting. I respect the experience component of geoscience and engineering. I never suggest that everything can be replaced by a machine. When I'm talking about automation, I'm not removing the need for expertise. And some expert judgment will remain subjective. I don't think in the open earth systems we work in that we'll be able to have the geoscientist engineer replaced by a box. And that'll come up over and over again as we talk about machine learning. We're going to work a lot with Jupyter Notebooks. We'll have lectures where we actually open them up, work with them. I just show images right now for now. Okay, it's, um, it's awesome. It's a WebBrit-based tool where you can open it up and have blocks of code, documentation, and results. So you can visualize and see your workflow. You can make it very nice. You can put equations in. It uses Markdown. If any of you have ever used LaTeX before, then um, you've, you're convinced it's a beautiful thing. You can build very beautiful looking text, right? Um, it's like that Markdown is like a distilled version of LaTeX or LaTeX. I guess people say it like that. And so you can put your equations and all your nice uh, enumeration, itemization, formatting, and so forth, tables, and so forth. Then you can have all of your code. You have explanation code, explanation code, and then you have output from the code and so forth. Very nice workflows you can share with others. What's really cool is you can even host this stuff online. That's, that's really, really cool. And then other people can load it up. In fact, run your workflow without actually having to set up an environment. They just run it online. I've done that before. That's super cool. Okay. So um, Jupyter will be used for many of the assignments. Um, I think some of it will be um, on paper or, you know, Word on by hand, but most of it will be um, using Jupyter. Okay, Geostats Pi. I, this is not shamelessly bragging. Um, last term, I was running a course in subsurface modeling, and I could not find good open source reliable software to be able to do exactly what I want to do in the course. So I went back to the fundamental geostatistical library, GeostLib, and I converted it into Python, most of it. I think I got all of it. It's pretty close. It's in two-dimensional. I haven't, I have, I've got more to do. And I also added in a bunch of other kind of practical modeling work steps, and that's available in Geostat Pi. It's open source, and I hope you appreciate it. It was a bunch of my weekends last term. <laughs> um, okay, so time to get technical. For next class, what we what you'll need to do is install Anaconda 3.7. I might be out of date. Anaconda 3. Okay, just Anaconda 3. I should have checked before I recorded this. On your laptop, and when you've installed that, you will have Python. Congratulations. You And many of the common packages will be available to you. you also install Geostat.py, which is my package. Once you've done that, you're good all the way up until we get to neural nets, at which point we'll do another install of a very specific version of Keras and TensorFlow, okay, so that we're able to run our examples. Okay, we're going to start working through workflows right away. So if you go to the Anaconda website, Anaconda download, as shown on this address right here, you're going to have a choice between Python 2 and Python 3. Python 2 to Python 3, there was significant, significant enough changes that there, things will be broken if you try to run the wrong version of Python. And we're reaching a point where I think everything has moved to Python 3, so we really do want to work in Python 3. So go ahead and install Anaconda. Um, for the Python 3 version, download it. Then what you can do is once you've installed it, you can go to your navigator down at the bottom, you know, the, um, oh, the magnifying glass. And you can type in Anaconda Navigator or just Navigator. It'll probably work. And you can open up Navigator. And from there, you can click on the tab to go to Environments. You'll see your base root environment. You click on the arrow and you can say Open Terminal. If you do that, you're guaranteed you'll have a terminal that anything you do in the terminal will be pointing to whatever you're doing when you're running the Jupyter Notebooks and everything should be aligned and that should work for you. So go ahead and open up that terminal 
in that terminal type pip install geostat.py and there should be some things happening automated installation it should install worry free so let me know if you have any problems with doing this we could always run through it in class together if people are having trouble with it let me, so caveats for this course it's ambitious it's the first time it's been run there's a lot of new content there's a lot going on it's so patience let me know if there's any issues um, let me know if you find errors in the lectures or the workflows and I'll do my best to improve. I put a lot of work into content. I've tried hard, but I'm not perfect. And I'm busy and distracted by a lot of things I'm trying to do right now. Troubleshooting. There's great Python documentation online. In fact, if you run into issues, it's a great way to learn. And so I invite you, try to troubleshoot and learn if there's something. Try to figure it out. Try to try new, do new things. I think it's good. If you type in a search for most coding problems, you'll find that the majority of the responses nowadays are in Python. It's so much activity in Python right now. There's so many examples. In fact, I'll let you know a little secret right now. Most good programmers sit there coding with things like Stack Overflow open as they're coding so that they can get all kinds of vice hints, the community giving them suggestions on how to solve common problems. I'm always happy to help out. Hong Kong's happy to help out RTA. Okay, the thing about the assignments, assignment documentation. When I give assignments, I'm going to expect written communication um, that's professional. When you're handing in Jupyter Notebooks, they should be brief, concise, clear documentation. Use efficient, creative figures to communicate. I don't want you to send me, you don't have to demonstrate that you work hard by sending me a 40-page assignment. It's not good for you. It's not good for, for our poor TA. And so be clear and concise, mixture of figures and text. Don't just put text. I mean, don't just put figures. Don't just put text. Make sure they support each other. And I'm going to be asking for executive summaries. Every assignment will have an executive summary. And I will ask a specific question I want answered with the executive summary. And so I want you to get used to writing these because this has huge impact if you do this. This is what's read by your manager. What was the issue or challenge? What's the gap? What was done to address that issue or challenge? Address the gap. What was the result of your work? What did you learn? And then what is your recommendation going forward? That's how you add value. And so that's what I'm going to expect. Okay. Um, let me go through just the other topics really quickly here. Now, whenever we have a coding course, it's very easy to slip into the issue of using other people's code. Now, remember, we're in the modern day. We're teaching machine learning. We've got some tools. You know what I'm saying? And so it's not hard for us to find if people are just handing in the same assignment or if next year people are handing in the assignments they found from this year, which we know everybody shares everything. Don't do it. It's not good for you. And we're going to have a zero tolerance policy around that. So please just, you have to, it has to be your work. I, I fully support the idea of sharing ideas, consulting with each other, helping each other. Yes. But at the end of the day, your assignment must be your assignment. Okay. <clears throat> There is a lot of code available online. You may take code chunks, but when you do, you do the right thing. Number one, don't take an entire workflow, of course. But if there's a function you need for a specific type of visualization, take it and cite it. Make it clear this function, put in your code as a function, and then put a comment around it saying that this was taken from source the name of the author, the website it came from. It's the right thing to do anyway. And so you can do that, provide credit, but don't take an entire work. So as far as assignments go, we'll have a variety of different um, submissions. If there's a Jupyter Notebook, it'll be electronic submission. If it's a um, something that's more paper-based, we may even do something in Excel at some point. We'll, look, we'll have, give you instructions for how to submit your assignments as we go along. Now, contact me as soon as possible if you're going to be absent or if you're going to, if there's an emergency or something that's impacting your ability to participate in the assignments. Um, late assignments, missed quizzes will be accepted with reasonable documented excuses. I need to be notified in advance. Um, unless it's something that's obvious that you can't notify me in advance, you know, something happened on the way to school or something, notify me as soon as possible. If you 
come to me a week later, two weeks later, three weeks later, and say, oops, I didn't have this in or something, that's not going to be something I can accept. So just make sure you notify me. I need document, some form of documentation. I'm willing to work with people if you have some type of sickness or emergency or something. Disabilities, um, I'm all about this. I want to make sure that there is no obstacles to anybody to attend my class, to be comfortable in my class, to succeed in my class. And so let me know. Come see me um, after class if you have accommodations and we will and we will make sure that we provide those to you to remove any obstacles to you succeeding in this class. So uh, as the instructor professor in this course I have a responsibility for providing a positive professional educational environment and so on these matters I will be quite stern throughout the entire class. No cell phones out at all. I will call you out repeated I will ask you to leave. You are more than more than welcome. If you need to take calls, text, or do whatever you need to do on your cell phone, just walk out of the class. I will never ever um, make you feel uncomfortable for leaving my class at any time, well, aside from an examination. <laughs> but you know, if you need to just go do something, I'm very respectful about that. That's your time. Go ahead, do that. Laptops only for course-related activities. I move around the class. I don't just stand up at the front. I don't think I. I think it's very distracting for other people who are attending the class to have to watch the news in front of themselves while they're trying to focus on the course material. Laptops only for course related activities. I'll call you out if you are not doing that. Disrespectful, negative comments, of course, ongoing discussions. Now I get it. At some point you may want to lean over to your neighbor and say, hey, what did Perch just say? Or what did that mean? And you just want to do something quick like that. I'm not going to be too upset if you're very careful to whisper and so forth, but ongoing discussions, I'm going to call you out for that too. Now, if, if you have an issue with not understanding a concept and it's a bigger, well, go ahead, just ask. And I, I'm sure there's many other people who didn't understand too. So you're contributing to the class. Remember that participation mark? Part of it is just ask questions when you have questions. So go ahead. Um, let's engage with the class. Let's not have a disruptive environment where people are unable to learn. So let's help each other out. Okay, so that is my overview, my introduction. Who am, who am I? Who I am? Motivation goals, class description, course objectives, grade distribution expectations, and the plan. So let me know if you have any questions. I'm excited once again. I'm really excited to get started in this course. I think we're going to have a lot of fun learning together. And so thank you very much. Let's let's just keep going. Let's just get this going. I'm excited. All right. Hey, um, I'm Michael Perch. I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I am the Geostat guy on Twitter and GitHub. I also have all of my lectures on YouTube on the Geostat guy lectures. All right, channel. All right. Thank you very much. Bye.